And I have exactly 12 o'clock, so we're going to start on time to keep everybody uh, together. Welcome to our Women's Health Seminar Series. My name is Suzanne Hetzel Campbell. I'm one of the faculty in the School of Nursing at UBC Vancouver and would like to welcome you all today. I'm also a co-lead with the Women's Health Seminar Series or the Women's Health Research Cluster, which this is a part of. Today, I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Jennifer Jacoby, I'm going to say it wrong, Jennifer, I apologize, who is a professor at the School of Health and Exercise Sciences at UBC Okanagan and is sharing with us today the significance of sex and muscle strength in understanding age-related loss of force control. She is a professor at the School of Health and Exercise Sciences and teaches and researches in the area of neuromuscular and exercise physiology. She's also PI for the Aging in Place Research Cluster that aims to support the needs and choice of older women and men to age in place through the development of in-home supportive technologies aimed at maintaining active living, functional independence, and social emotional health. In Dr. Jacoby's lab, her basic research program centers upon identifying contributions of central descending and sensory reflex pathways to the modulation of motor neuron activity and subsequent effect on force control in women, which is part of NSERC. This work informs the design of her applied research program that focuses on developing interventions to promote maintaining function independence in older men and women. Her work is funded by the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada and CIHR. She was recently awarded the NSERC Chair for Women in Science and Engineering for the BC Yukon region. Through this program, donors and her SHRC research, she will determine and apply knowledge of positive factors that contribute to recruiting and retaining women in the sciences. So welcome. I would like to acknowledge and recognize that we live, work, play, and participate in community on the unceded, unceded, sorry, and traditional territories of the 203 First Nations, along with 38 Meti chartered communities, each of which possess their own unique traditions and history here on this land that we now refer to as British Columbia. We acknowledge the importance of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's call to action, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and the BC Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. In all of our work, we are committed to ensuring Indigenous women's rights to health and safety and the equal opportunity to participate in a manner that recognizes and respects Indigenous cultures and traditions. Today, I am joining you from Vancouver and the Semiamu lands, which is part of the unceded homelands of the Coast Salish peoples and the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Stolo, and tsleil First Nations. Please feel free to uh, use the chat feature and acknowledge where you are joining us from. So a two minute advertisement on who we are as the Women's Health Research Cluster. We have over 250 members that are scientists, students and community members who live and work in 11 countries around the world. We have a number of different events for diverse audiences, give out several awards to student members and collaborate with community partners. If you're interested in becoming a member, please go to our website and click become a member. Membership is free and it gives you access to members only services such as awards and research facilitation. And with no further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Jacoby. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go about setting up this presentation view. Um, so just ensuring that you can see the right screen. So can everyone see the presentation now? Yeah, we're good. Okay. 
um, you'd think after 18 to 24 months of Zoom, uh, we'd all be familiar and comfortable with this. Um, I am also going to identify, um, I can't really see the chat very well. So if there are questions in the chat, I'm happy to address them um, as we progress forward. Uh, Dr. Campbell, uh, please feel free to interrupt me um, or stop me as I'm moving forward. And we can just uh, have a conversation about anything that happens to pop up in the chat. Um, the other thing that I want to identify is that I am joining you from the unceded and the ancestral uh, lands of the Silk Okanagan people. I'm in Kelowna, British Columbia at UBC Okanagan. And the uh, Okanagan nation or the territory of the Silk Okanagan people expands through the interior of British Columbia all the way down into the northern parts of um, Washington. And I am very grateful that I get to work in such a beautiful place. So what I'm going to go about presenting today is an overview of age and sex specific changes. Before I get into that, what I really want to acknowledge is what often gets lost at the end is the amazing group of trainees that I've had the opportunity to work with um, and represent here today, their work. Um, most notably, those that uh, were able to collect data to pre-pandemic and those that have um, worked throughout the pandemic in the Zoom world as we're now starting to enter back into the lab. So what I'm gonna do this morning, or I guess this afternoon now, is I'm gonna lay the groundwork on who older Canadian men and women are from a demographic perspective. I'm then gonna talk about sex-specific age-related change um, relative to functional decline, frailty, and forced steadiness. I'm then going to spend a few moments talking about pre-frailty and an exercise intervention for women, and then draw some conclusions. So, who are older Canadians? Um, well, first off, this particular um, graphic from 2017 hasn't changed that much. Um, and I will identify that the data from the pandemic is just coming out and it shows influencing of about um, half a year. So that the, the overall trend in the data that I'm showing doesn't seem to be impacted by the pandemic yet that greatly. And the reason I state that is in 2016 and on the X axis um, is the data in years. Um, and in 2016, the number of seniors shown in the red line, and these are 65 plus, actually exceeded the number of children zero to 14 years. This is the first time in the history of Canada, if not the history of the world, that this occurred. And the projection outwards to 2051 and 2061 is quite extreme in that the number of older adults are going to far exceed the number of children. What's most interesting is in 2016, um, as we progress outwards to 2051, is the population is expected to grow in the oldest age cohorts. And that's actually in the centenarians and those um, also 65 and plus. So if we look at this from not only a population perspective, but a sex perspective, what I'm showing on this graph here is that if we look at the demographic and the population about 50 years of age, the proportion population in millions on the x-axis of men and women is very similar. It's about 1.3 million. Now, if we go up and look at, let's say those about 80 years of age, you can see the trend between the red side on the right and the blue side on the left with red being female and blue being male is that the line for the male are getting closer to the midline, meaning the population percentage for men or males is less than females. This is really interesting as we approach many older age groups, which is the fastest growing population, which is the centenarians, which between 2011 to 2016 increased in um, growth by 41%. It was the fastest growing age cohort is that the number of females exceeds the number of men, almost double it. So it's really important that we start to consider not only age-related decline, but we look at sex-specific age-related decline. Now, I feel like I might be talking to the converted, so to speak, in this particular audience when it comes to actually understanding um, sex and gender-based differences. But the one thing I want to acknowledge is not just sex, but gender. 
what I'm going to present today is largely sex-based research. As a physiologist, I mostly focus on sex. However, the influence of gender is really important. Um, and I don't want to underestimate that role, but most of what you're going to see today is sex-based differences. Based upon when it's published, and if it's my data, how hard I fought back on reviewers to actually use the words males and females, and sex um, might be influenced by whether you see women or men on the slides. Um, many reviewers in the past were very uncomfortable to use sex as a noun as opposed to a verb. And we are starting to slowly see changes in that. And I raise this as I look at this particular graph. A colleague and myself, um, who are associate editors for Applied Physiology, Nutrition and Metabolism, which is the flagship journal for the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology and the Canadian Society for Nutrition. So this is the journal for Canadian research when it comes to exercise, physical activity and nutrition. And what we did is a deep dive into this uh, research that's been published within the journal from the inception of the journal in the mid 19, um, early 1990s, all the way out to 2020. And what we discovered when we looked at this particular journal, and I've also done this for another journal that I'm an associate editor on, which is the Journal of Aging and Physical Activity. And the results are sadly very similar that the amount of research in this particular case done on females as shown in the graph here in green is much less than the number of studies that were conducted on males shown in blue. And if we look at the number of studies as a percentage of the total studies, what you can see is what's driving the data overall when we look at both males and females in studies together is the fact that it was including males. So there really is a need to um, study females when it comes to physical activity, exercise, and nutrition. And hopefully, as you can see with the line um, in 2020, starting to show the inflection that this will change. So generally, the Canadian population is graying. It's becoming older. The fastest cohort of increase is the oldest cohort, meaning those 65 and plus, with the greatest increase in the older adults being in the oldest old, which is the centenarians. And generally across the literature, we do a really um, less than great job of studying females when it comes to sex-specific age-related decline or physical activity. But what do we know about sex-specific age-related decline? Well, the first thing that we know is that mobility does decline with increasing age, and this has been shown through GPS, accelerometer, pedometer, questionnaire, and it's been um, studied in both community dwelling older adults as well as residential um, or assisted living older adults, that there is a general decline in mobility with increasing age. We also know that women are at higher risk than men for functional dependence. And this higher incidence um, equates, to, equates to a greater long-term disability in women. And we also know that mobility is a key factor for maintaining independence. So you can see there's an, a connection here between mobility and independence. And as mobility declines, so too does independence. What is also interesting and related to this is women have a higher incidence or prevalence rather of frailty. And not only do women have a higher prevalence of frailty, but studies are showing, if we look at the frailty index, um, that females have higher frailty index scores than males. However, females tolerate frailty better. So they have a lower mortality rate at any given frailty index score or age. And this equates or relates back to something like the health survival paradox where that we say women are living longer, but they're living in a greater state of disability or frailty in this particular incidence. So whether we account for frailty or age, women are survivors for certain, but they do live with a greater incidence um, of functional decline. What I want to identify with frailty is it's not a stationary aspect when we quantify it. Frailty has a continuum. And there's a variety of different scales to measure frailty. All of them categorize individuals a little bit different. What I'm showing on this, scale, on this particular slide is Freed's method or Freed's phenotype, 
where frailty is categorized through five criteria being weight loss, exhaustion, low physical activity, muscle weakness um, measured with hand grip, and slow walking speed. And if an individual um, reports, and much of this is self-report other than the muscle weakness measured through hand grip, no deficits, then they're considered non-frail or robust. If they report one to two of these criteria, they're considered to be early signs of frailty, so pre-frail. And when they report three or more of these frailty criteria, they're considered frail. If you notice the arrow on the top, it shows a transition. So an individual, perhaps if experiencing flu or bedridden for a fall, they might become more frail. They might lose weight. So that might slide them into um, a frail category from a pre-frail category. This is what we don't want to see, is individuals progressing to a greater state of frailty. What we do know is we can also shift this paradigm so they're becoming less frail. That might mean a frail person becoming pre-frail or even non-frail and a pre-frail person becoming non-frail. Key things to keep in mind here that we know from the literature is one way to intersect and better an older adult's state of frailty is through exercise. And I'm gonna come back to this in the end of the presentation. In the lab though, we can't really understand the neuromuscular contributions to frailty. And that's what my lab is interested in, is what are the neuromechanical factors that are contributing to individuals being more frail, experienced in a state of functional decline. So in order for us to best represent this in the lab, we need to have a technique that enables us to understand functional decline. And what we have is a technique that we use to measure um, functional ability or functional control through isometric models of force steadiness. And when individuals perform these isometric tasks and their tracking tasks, we can make a number of neuromuscular measurements that we can then determine if these are underlying contributions to functional decline or frailty. So let's take a moment and I'm gonna to explain to you what I mean by isometric models of force steadiness. In the top right hand corner, you can see I'm showing data for a young male and an old male. Um, very evident in the bottom panel is the black line and this is the tracking task. And the blue line shows the ability of either the older male or the younger male to actually create an isometric contraction where they increase their force to a given target level they then try to hold this isometric contraction against a target force and then relax. And what we do for these contractions is we measure the ability of the individual to maintain this isometric plateau. We calculate this based upon the amplitude of the fluctuations around the target line through a measurement of standard deviation. And then we also can utilize the um, force that they targeted, the mean force, as a, as a measure of normalization. So that we then take the standard deviation of the amplitudes and um, divide it or express it as a ratio of the mean force. So we then have an absolute and a relative measure um, of force steadiness. What we know from these measures, and I'm just gonna admit someone, there we go. Um, what we know from these measurements of isometric force steadiness is they are related to functional ability. I'm showing you data here from Marmon's paper in 2011, um, where there were greater than 100 older adults. I believe it was close to 150, and about 40 or 50 of them were female. And what they did is they measured isometric force steadiness from a hand muscle. They used hand grip. And they also use this grooved pegboard test and they created a variety of different relationships and to understand if isometric force steadiness relates to these clinical measures of um, hand dexterity. And 36% of the variance in pegboard time was explained by force steadiness or maximal grip strength. Mm -hmm. So from this particular study, I'm showing you that these measures of isometric force steadiness enable us to best understand um, functional abilities through these standard clinical scales. And then later on, I'm gonna speak a little bit more to the standard clinical scales. What do we know about force steadiness though? Well, first off, let's look at males and females. Now, 
In this particular diagram on the x-axis, I'm showing you the force level as a relative percentage of maximal. And on the y-axis, I'm expressing CV of force. So this is the normalized measure of force steadiness. Because it's a normalized measurement of force steadiness, the lower the score, the steadier you are. So in this particular diagram, the males across all force levels until we get to higher forces are substantially steadier than the females, which are shown in the open circles. That particular data was from the elbow flexors. In this particular slide, what I'm now showing you is what's evident for the elbow flexors between young males and females is also evident for a variety of muscle groups, um, different tasks and force levels. So the inset diagram is showing you males in the filled boxes and females in the open. And all we've done is subtract very, very high technique here, the coefficient of variation for the males from the females. And in all cases, since the females coefficient of variation is higher across all force levels, females are less steady than males. The N at the top of each bars refers to the number of studies that we gain this data from. Most of the data is done at low force levels around 5 and 10%. Not only are females less steady than males across all force levels, but females are less steady than males for most muscle group study. In the big diagram on the bottom, we're showing you the various muscle groups that have been studied across the literature that's presented in the inset whether it be um, pinch grip, uh, wrist extensors, a lot of data on the elbow flexors. Um, this is hip extensors, hip flexors, knee extensors, and dorsiflexors. And with the um, exception of this one particular study in the knee extensors, in all cases, females are less steady than males. And what is also um, interesting is that generally, especially since we have a lot of data on the elbow flexors, um, the upper body tends to be less steady than the lower body. I want to highlight that this hip extensor data is seemingly throwing off the norm, but it's only one study um, done on the hip extensors. And it's an odd group to measure when it comes to uh, force variability or force steadiness. So what I've now shown you is that we have a state of functional decline with age whereby females experience greater functional decline, greater frailty, and are unable to produce um, isometric force controlled tasks as well as their male counterparts. So then the question becomes why? What are these underlying factors that are contributing to an inability of females to produce these isometric contractions. And this is especially important because we know these isometric contractions relate to clinical tests of um, hand dexterity, for example. We also know, and I will show you more data in a little bit, that they also relate to functional mobility scores. So if we could better understand what are the underlying causes of differences in force steadiness, we might be able to target um, specific underlying causes to declines in functional mobility with age, especially in women. So where might these origins of um, decreased force steadiness or, or reduced ability to control force come from in females? Well, it could start in the brain all the way from the ability to generate the motor command to create the movement. It could travel down the spinal cord. It could live at the level of the spinal cord or go all the way out to the muscle and uh, showing in the small insert on the left by a, a art, piece of artwork done for my own lab by one of my graduate students all the way out to the tendon. There's very little data um, from the brain. It's growing as far as um, an understanding of the motor command, but where we have a lot of data is the level of the motor neuron. The challenge with this data is most of it's based upon men. So I'll address that in a second. The other element that's key for force control is the muscle and the, what I believe to be the unsung or overlooked hero, potentially the tendon. And that's where I'm gonna focus briefly now is identify the motor unit and then go on out and look at the tendon. So what do we know about the motor neuron? Well. Most of the literature today is showing, uh, to date rather, is showing a really high correlation between the ability of the motor neuron pool to control force. 
So it's not the individual motor units. And that's what the literature first showed um, in the late 90s and early 2000s, was if a motor unit had a great amount of variability, then that contributed to force steadiness. We've advanced techniques to these high density surface EMG arrays, and they're showing that it's the, the common input and the modulation output, if you will, from the entire motor neuron pool. So it's the common elements, in this diagram it's shown on the top right, as you have these common inputs going to the motor neuron pool, and then you also have these independent inputs. The independent inputs, for lack of a better analogy here, get kind of filtered out at the level of the motor neuron pool. And I will identify, it's not a true filter, but what is transferred through that motor neuron pool is the common input. And the fluctuations within that common input in a frequency band is tightly correlated to the um, frequency modulation from the force output. Now, this is really interesting because it's telling us that the motor neuron pool itself as a whole within a muscle and between muscles actually controls force output. The challenge with this is most of the data has been done on that. If we look at the motor neuron data from females and humans, there's not a lot, less than a dozen papers. So we have to rely on the animal literature. And what the animal literature is showing us is there might be a sex specific compensatory counterbalance. That's a big long way to saying is that males have bigger motor neurons, which is not good for this kind of filtering effect, if you will, but they have a greater number of motor neurons where females have smaller motor neurons, and this is all from rat models, but there's too few of them to create a difference. So it is speculation, but part of the difference between males and females might relate to the manner in which the motor neuron pool receives, processes these inputs, the common fluctuations, and then transfers them out to the periphery. So this is something we're working on and we hope to provide data on really soon. What we can identify as the topic of this presentation indicated is strength. Strength of the contractile elements is a key factor in the difference in ability for men and women to produce steady contractions. And strength is also a key factor in why steadiness decreases with age. So on the left, I'm showing you some data from the elbow flexors again, but in this particular case, the individuals produced a contraction in the neutral forearm position, the supinated forearm position, which is hard to do through zoom here, and then the pronated forearm position. Across all of these positions, strength will change. But when we look at the absolute force that is produced across the positions between young men, young men and women, the stronger you are, shown here out towards the right, the lower your coefficient of variation means, which means the stronger you are, the steadier you are. And you can see the men clustering out here towards the right. Unfortunately, the women out here towards the left, meaning they're more variable. And what's really interesting is you have this smattering of males and females in the middle. So we were intrigued. What happens when males and females are matched for strength? So that's what we went about doing. And on the top right, inset, you can see we, we matched females and males for absolute strength. And then we had them produce these isometric force steadiness contractions. This once again is data from young females and young males. And what is really interesting is the males are in the filled bars, which is surprising because I've been telling you that the males are steadier than females. When you match males and females for strength, the females become steadier than the males. This tells us that there is something beyond strength contributing to the ability to produce steady contractions. And we know from the motor neuron data that when you look at regression analysis, about 30% of your ability to control force is coupled between maximal strength and the activity of the motor neuron pool. That's what the regression analysis shows us. Not cause and effect, but definitely a good correlation. In this study, we removed strength and females are steadier. So that alludes to the fact that there is some element of the motor neuron pool or potentially physical activity that is contributing to females being steadier than males. This particular data was collected just prior to the pandemic. 
And we are now working on the data set um, for publication and to finalize um, a few last subjects. So I'll be interesting to see what the reviewers have to say with respect to our thoughts on this. It's hot off the press. The other element that I wanna draw attention to is what happens when men and women or males and females age. In the top right-hand diagram, I'm showing you projected data uh, across a variety of different studies in the literature that shows leg strength. This is your knee extensors. The open circles are females and the filled circles are males. What is shocking is that at about 46 years of age, there's an abrupt decline in leg extension strength in females and the rate of decline over time, the slope of the line is far greater in females. So females have a greater age-related loss and an earlier onset of age-related loss in lower limb or knee extensor strength. However, the arms don't show the same differences. The arms in both males and females, and this is elbow flexors, using the largest muscle groups possible, knee extensors and elbow flexors, you can see that the onset of um, age-related strength loss is very similar between males and females just before the age of 60. And the decline is very similar as far as a rate over time. So males and females both experience age-related loss of strength. This loss of strength is going to contribute to a reduction in force control. However, the loss of strength is greater in the lower body than it is in the upper body. And there's a potential for preservation of strength in the upper body Perhaps because of use, as we become older, we walk less, our mobility decreases, so our leg strength might um, decline at a faster rate. It might also due to the fact that if you look on the x-axis in the top panel, males just start off so much stronger than females, so they do have more to lose. That could be part of it. The other element that we need to consider is with age, our upper body use doesn't decline as much as our lower body use. Ultimately, the diagram on the left shows you that if you are a 21 year old compared to a 63 year old with age, there is a decline in your absolute muscle mass and there is an infiltration of non-contractile properties outside the muscle as well as inside the muscle. And if we can change this or at least slow down the decline, we might be able to preserve function. That's the key element. Yeah. Can I just jump in one quick question on that last slide? You talked about non-contractility. I'm seeing huge differences in the pictures between the 21 and 63. Can you just explain a little bit further what you mean, or are you doing that in the next slides? No, nope, that's a great question. Non-contractile okay. elements is anything that's non-muscle, most okay. often referred to as subcutaneous fat. There's an increase in subcutaneous fat. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, I'm gonna switch now over to the tendon a little bit. So I've really highlighted the importance of absolute strength, um, the importance of um, ensuring that males and females, especially females may not experience, um, or when they do experience a greater um, age-related loss in strength and an earlier onset, how this impacts force steadiness in a negative manner and what happens if you match for strength. But the key thing to keep in mind, and we often overlook is the tendon, because when your muscle contracts, it shortens. And because that muscle shortening um, pulls on the tendon, that means the tendon elongates. And in order for a joint to um, produce force, or to undergo a change in range of motion, there's a change within the tendon. So it'd be almost foolish to think that the, talent, the tendon within itself can't contribute to force control. So this is what we set about doing a few years ago is to better understand the tendon's contribution to force control. So as this tendon is elongating, is it actually dissipating or potentially exacerbating what is happening at the level of the muscle as it's transferred to the bone? So what I'm gonna show you here is how we go about collecting some of these measurements. Um, many of them are mathematical extrapolations to determine tendon mechanics gained from the world of engineering. The key thing to keep in mind is if we think about mechanics of material properties such as concrete or metal, 
it doesn't change in diameter when you actually, um, nor does it contract. But this is the difference in a physiological measurement is that you've got dynamic changes that we have to account for. So how we account for this is with ultrasonography. What you're gonna see on the right is what we do as an operator of the ultrasound. What you're gonna see on the left is the video that's recorded from muscle underlying the skin. And if the video works, uh, both of them should be synchronized. Let's see what happens. So what we do while individuals are holding these contractions is scan up the uh, arm or limb or muscle of interest, um, very similar to taking a panic, um, panoramic photo. And what happens then is we compile these videos to then create this panoramic image where we can measure um, long lengths and muscle, tendon, a variety of different images um, of anatomical structures as we're shown here. So we don't have to use MRI, we don't have to open up the skin, we can use ultrasonography to gain these measures of length, cross-sectional area of both fascicles shown in the top right, um, overall uh, tendon length as well, or muscle length. What we do from these measurements then is accounting for the fact that the muscle is shortening and the tendon is elongating, we use absolute measures of force and lever arms to create mathematical equations to determine tendon force. I'm gonna go through this really quickly, calculating tendon stiffness, tendon strain, tendon stress, and then normalized measures of stiffness. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time um, or really any time talking about how we do this math. I can talk about it later, but what I wanted to identify specifically is that we're not measuring um, inherently the tendon. We just can't do that in a human model. So we're extrapolating mathematical um, calculations of tendon mechanics. What we see, first off, is we have to remember that the tendon is viscoelastic and it has elements of hysteresis. Viscoelastic means, as I've identified, the length is going to change and the tendon can return to its original length. However, hysteresis of the tendon indicates that it's not a perfect elastic. So what we look at when we see this, and I'm showing pre and post training, is that if an individual produces a, um, what we call a pyramidal contraction, so they perform um, a contraction from low force levels up to a peak or maximum, and then they decline back down. So it's like a pyramidal shape, up and down. And what we do in that shape is we measure how much the tendon changes over time. If the tendon was a perfect elastic, the um, change in length for a given load as it goes up, as it goes up, and I hope you can see my um, arrow in uh, the contraction, would be perfectly matched as it comes down. You can see it's not. So the area between the contractile up and the contraction element down is referred to the um, hysteresis or the area under the curve. And the importance of strength. A strength training intervention not only increases muscle strength, but also pre to post training is going to make the tendon stiffer. So there's an ability here that with exercise training, maybe we're not only um, inducing a contractile change, but we're potentially um, creating a tendon change that could benefit force. What I also want to highlight is the fact that this changes between males and females between the follicular and the luteal phase. The follicular phase, the tendon uh, stiffness is much greater than the um, luteal phase. This is really important because what we're showing here is that based upon the phase of menstruation, um, you can have a change in tendon stiffness and what the literature hasn't accounted for is the menstrual phase. The studies that I'm showing on this particular slide were um, pulled from the literature in 2019. I need to um, update this, but there's only been four or five studies since that time. And across all instances, males have stiffer tendons than females. And that's whether we look at an absolute stiffness or a normalized measure of stiffness, which we refer to as Young's modulus, which I can um, speak to later. But generally males tendons are stiffer than females. Menstrual cycle was only accounted for in one of these studies. 
This is really important and exciting because what this graph is showing us is that the stiffer the tendon out towards the right, the steadier the contraction. So now we've got data to show its muscle strength and tendon stiffness that's contributing to this ability to control force. And this is key because not only do um, males and females differ in tendon stiffness and your ability to control force, but so does young and old. So once again, showing coefficient of variation, your young individuals are steadier than your old individuals and your young individuals have stiffer tendons than your old individuals. When we put all of this together and start looking at the contractile force and the tendon, what we're showing is that the stronger you are and the stiffer your tendon, the steadier you are. So as the muscle shortens, the tendon elongates and the cross-sectional area of the tendon decreases as it stretches out. And at these low forces, the slack within the tendon is taken up to a level that the tendon potentially, um, what we're beginning to believe actually dissipates some of the fluctuations that are produced at the level of the motor neuron that are transmitted through the muscle. Why we believe this is happening is the opposite as we go to high forces occurs is the tendon can no longer dissipate this force. The relationship is the inverse. So at low force contractions, which is largely where our daily activities are concerned, we are steadier because we're stronger and our tendons are stiffer. And that differs between males and females. When we put all of this together in a crazy multiple linear regression model, about 65%, upwards of 72% um, of our ability to control force is combined by the tendon and the muscle. And earlier I showed you that the ability of the tendon with strength controls for about 30%. COVID um, happened, so we couldn't put everything together. So we're hoping to do that. We've now been back in the lab for about four to five weeks here on the Okanagan campus, maybe a little bit longer. So now we can start putting all of these measurements together. And most importantly, including females because what other studies have shown is there's a really strong correlation um, and relationship between plantar flexion strength, Achilles tendon stiffness for your six minute walking ability and your timed up and go. So these lab based measurements of force steadiness are giving us a really strong indication of what's going on in the real world for older adults because we simply just can't live in their houses and watch them go about and understand the uh, neuromechanical factors. That so are Jennifer, happening. I can't tell if it. Sorry, you're muted. Suzanne, was there something there? Sometimes shutting the note can help with the Sorry, there's a question, but it's cutting out. Could you try again? Suzanne, I can't hear the question. So I just got kicked out and back in again. So maybe it was just me having trouble with hearing and whatever else. And if it was clear for everyone else, I'm just going to let it be. Okay. There are no questions right now. I have plenty when you're done. And I think we're at just a couple minutes to yeah. start with questions. No worries. So what I'm gonna um, switch to here is just a little bit of a teaser on where we're going with respect to now we have an, a really strong under, indication. And we know this from the literature that physical activity and exercise is good. But what about how, how great can it be for females? Well, fortunately, we had a master student, which is um, a little bit risky, but he wanted to undertake an exercise um, intervention training program for pre-frail older women. So what we did is designed an exercise program based upon the literature for pre-frail older women, focusing largely on resistance training because we know that benefits the contractile elements and the tendon. 
these individuals, and we did have a little bit of pushback from family members and family physicians, underwent just not a standard exercise intervention, but for anyone who does strength training or no strength training, they actually did heavy squats and deadlifts. So it wasn't a um, program for the weak of heart, if you, so, so to speak. However, where we pushed back and making it real was if you wanna sit on the toilet or lift your groceries, every day you do a squat and a deadlift. So we had them do these really intense exercises. And I'm just gonna give you a little bit of teaser um, is that after 12 weeks of this program, the exercise group increased in strength. That should be no surprise. They increased or they decreased their sit to stand time. They got better and they walked faster. All of these are shown in the um, exercise compared to control group or the exercises, your darker bands. What I really want to focus on is going back to frailty because we know women experience a greater level of frailty than men and they live with this longer. So we need to, we need to do something. So this is a busy slide showing you exactly what we did. We calculated or determined frailty based upon the three different scales. Um, one of them being gait speed because every scale is a little bit different. And then we clustered these individuals and for the top row, the order of the subjects are shown in the exact same um, hierarchy as they are in the middle panel and the lower panel based upon calculating Freed's frailty phenotype, the clinical frailty scale, or gait speed. If you are less frail, you're on the left. If you're more frail, you're on the right. If an arrow goes towards the left, the 12 week intervention um, enabled you to become less frail. If you move towards the right, you became more frail. Let's break it down and look at the control group. Most of those arrows are going to the left or the dots are remaining stationary, meaning they didn't change over 12 weeks. Not changing over 12 weeks is, is okay, but going to the left over 12 weeks is downright scary considering 12 weeks is really less than three months and these individuals are becoming more frail. What happened to the exercise group? Well, as shown by the arrows, they became less frail. There were individuals that in some cases based upon their gait speed were actually determined to be in a frail category. They became substantially less frail. Most of our categorization was done based upon um, the clinical frailty scale, and once again, became less frail, with the exception of one particular line here became more frail when we looked at the clinical frailty scale. So overall, what this data is showing you, that exercise interventions um, work based upon the physiology, there's a need to create exercise interventions that might be sex specific, especially if we wanna do frailty in the population cohort that is most impacted which is females. So with that being said, older adults are growing in number in Canada. The population is largely growing at the highest end, your centenarians. The vast majority of that population is females. Females are less steady than males. Females can become steadier than males if they're stronger and have a stiffer tendon. And we can increase tendon stiffness and muscle strength with an appropriate exercise intervention that focuses on resistance training. And there still is a lot of work that needs to be done to better understand females when it comes to the neuromuscular system, as well as across the menstrual cycle. And with that being said, thank you very much. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Jacoby. This was um, really, Fascinating and interesting. I have not seen any questions in the chat screen, which means I get to ask all my questions first. Now I understand why Lisa enjoys that so much. Um, so I, I'm coming from a nursing perspective and I'm thinking about health promotion and working with older adults. And I'm wondering when you, you were talking specifically about resistance training with weights, if there's a difference between bands and weights, or if that's something still to be studied. The only difference is the amount of load that you place with on the system. And the key difference is here, load the system. So 
although I don't really always appreciate the um, expression, use it or lose it, <laughs> it definitely applies here. And the other element that applies is progressive overload. So if you use a band and you start with a band and it's really light, and then six weeks later, or really heavy, and then six weeks later, it's really easy to move that band, you need more bands or different color bands to increase the resistance. So the progressive so, load, that's yeah, what the key thing is, oh, you have to overload the muscle to create a change. Okay. And I'm still looking in the chat. I don't see any. Um, where does yoga fit? <laughs> <laughs> a variety of different places. I would say the first place yoga fits is actually maybe, well, not actually, maybe that's a really conundrum there, is actually <laughs> the element of social connectedness, um, as well as mental and mindfulness health. Um, so there's that element with respect to yoga that I don't want to underestimate and I don't study. So I, I like to identify at that at the beginning, mm -hmm. but the element where yoga comes into play is flexibility and balance. Thank you. That's what I was thinking too. The flexibility and balance and the socialization is important as well. I I'm reaching out. We had some fabulous uh, folks in the room here with us today. Are there any other questions or comments? This is such important work. And I have a son who is a mechanical electric engineer looking at health promotion types, aids, like what you're talking and fluidity. Yep. So some of this was making some sense, but of course I'm partial to connecting it to um, health. Well, that's what we're trying to do in the aging in place research cluster. We're a group of um, health, um, health researchers and engineers. So we're trying to figure out how do we engineer uh, technology to better the health of these older adults. And that could be from grab bars to uh, computerized elements of physical activity and social engagement. It, we, we cover the gamut within that group. And it's so important to bring these fields together um, and ensure that for us, um, one of the key elements is that what we're designing is appropriate for the population. And um, nobody, I think, in this group will be surprised to remember um, when the seatbelt tests were first done, how the um, dummies that they were, like, were young men. Well, right. we've come a long way since then, but we haven't come far enough because we're still designing aids for older adults who are men. And that's what we're trying to change. Well, and I think what, what struck me so much were the statistics that you shared early on, demonstrating the change in our demographics, which I guess I knew I didn't really know about that centarian aspect. Yeah, 41% <laughs> increase in that group alone. Isn't um, that shocking? It is. Oh, good. Stephanie, you have a question. Please jump in. Hello, um, I really enjoyed your talk. This is uh, a little outside of my research area, but I have uh, two questions for you. One is um, in your data sets, do you take into consideration or control for uh, individuals who have had fractures, um, either vertebral or hip fractures, because those can be very different. Um, yeah. And then my second question is, I wanted to hear your thoughts on um, potentially uh, starting interventions earlier, for example, when women are starting to go through the menopause transition and how that might impact, you know, the trajectory of moving from a non-frail state into a frail state. Yeah, great questions. Um, so with respect to the exercise interventions, the whole body interventions, um, if they have no uh, contraindications to exercise, we include them. Um, the elements of prior breaks, whether it be hip or back are, are definitely a concern. One of the individuals in the exercise intervention that I showed you did have um, a hip fracture and a subsequent replacement and underwent the exercise intervention um, just quite, quite fine. Relative to vertebral factors, we haven't had anyone report that. Um, we haven't had anyone to my knowledge in our studies and I'm just thinking no one that I can think off the top of my head that's had a vertebral fracture. Although I have someone very close in my life that has had vertebral fractures and had back surgery for them. And I think that element of understanding how the repair itself influences long-term function is going to be key. I don't think we've done enough work on that. Um, relative to when women should start exercising with respect to strength training, 
Well, now, <laughs> the earlier, the better. Um, I don't like to think or suggest there is a reserve in strength, but the stronger you can become, the younger you are. It is true that the lower you have to fall to lose your functional ability. Um, and I think the key point is around menopause. Um, if we can train strength earlier, it's better. But as an individual is approaching menopause, there's, that's where that abrupt change happens. Do I think it's completely hormonal? No, because if it was completely hormonal, upper body and lower body should change the same and it doesn't. So around menopause, it is key um, to increase your strength and especially your lower body strength. And I say that as a runner who really dislikes going to the gym, but loves to study and promote neuromuscular <laughs> function and exercise resistance training. So it's hard. I appreciate that. And I think you made the point that it, that men have, you know, a longer way to fall. Maybe, I don't know if that's the right word, but, um, you know, if, if more women, uh, in our, in our society, it's pretty sedentary. We're open to or used to doing strength training during um you know adulthood pre-menopause maybe we would see see differences there so um yeah really interesting and important work thank you thank you stephanie and was there anything else you thought while you were presenting that you wish you had two more minutes to talk about oh great question um i love what i do so i could talk about it forever I guess the key thing um, that I'd like to share with this group, and it's like I said in the beginning, I'm, I'm speaking to the converted, but we really need to better understand the neuromuscular system from the perspective of females. And that's not just older females. We've done a much better job studying older females than we've actually um, done studying women around the age of menopause and most notably controlling for um, hormonal fluctuations across um, menses. Um, but the other element that we're starting to look at here and ask is the um, hormonal replacement, whether it be for menopause or whether it be for birth control and the different types of birth control that are now out there, which from oral contraceptives to patches to IUDs, like there's just so much and these hormones definitely impact the system. So I guess I would encourage individuals to not only just look at females, but very carefully look at the hormonal supplementation they're on or not on. Thank you for expanding on that. I was very struck by the uh, luteal follicular phase mm -hmm. differences. And I wondered to myself, what about menopause? But then you're right that we don't know the effect of the other components. Yeah, it's it's... And, and what's interesting is that was a, a one particular example from one particular subject, and most of them show that, but there's so much variability that we've got 13 or 14 subjects and we still don't have a statistical difference. Yet the, the, there's clear differences when you look at each individual, it's, it's, it's mind numbing. So we're going back and redoing that data again and collecting um, hormonal levels across the cycle and normalizing our curves to the hormonal levels. Um, well, so hopefully you that did will get frailty tendencies. I wondered if osteoporosis fit into that and Stephanie asked related to the fractures too. I'm sure that's a component of it. Yeah. The, the element of osteoporosis, even uh, yes, it's, it's a key factor bone health as well. Well, I think we're just about at time. I'm looking at my uh, fellow controllers of this system. <laughs> and I am thrilled that I got to moderate today. This was really fascinating and exciting. Good to know what good work is happening up there in the Okanagan. It's wonderful to share it with the group. Definitely. Thank you all.